sickest podcast. Tune in for the audio, or you can even watch back. Giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is the time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. To my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. to listen to the sick podcast with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time 
Boston four, Montreal three. Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into Lemaire back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> You're in the ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la bonne. Et le côté Canadien, ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. You found the dogs! John, you found the dogs! He found the dogs! And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group, driven to be different. La Vida TV, embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Marinero on this Monday, March 11th. Thanks, everyone, for watching on YouTube Live, on Facebook Live, and on Twitter Live. It is the Sick Podcast, and I am Tony Marinero, and it's brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, named by the Financial Times as one of America's fastest-growing companies in 2023, recognized by the Globe and Mail as a top-growing Canadian company for two years in a row. They work with some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies providing end-to-end logistic services. Join a winning team and check out Energy's career page for available opportunities. Also brought to you in part by these guys right here, La Bitta TV Brewed in Quebec, a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bitta TV offers quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bitta TV, embrace your true nature. Also brought to you in part by... Playground, get ready to LOL and enjoy a fun evening with friends. This event promises to tickle your funny bone and leave you in stitches. Don't miss out on this opportunity to laugh until it hurts. Reserve your spot now for a night of nonstop laughter at Playground. Remember, it's every Wednesday at 8 p.m. where the jokes fly and the laughs just don't stop. Don't miss out on the funniest night of the week at Playground where every laugh is louder than the last. See you there for a night of unforgettable oh yeah come join us at playground just over the mercy bridge only minutes from downtown montreal playground experience the strip without the trip and of course brought to you in part by accent insurance solutions where you know all our insurance isn't created equal and you know where to find the right solution for you it's accent insurance of course Accent doesn't sell insurance. They shop it for you to find the right product right on the money, whatever your insurance needs are, home, automobile, or business. And every time I think of my buddy, Sergio Momesso, I think of their phone number. Call the Accent team today at 514-363-3636 and get the right solution at the right price. We're talking insurance, of course. Visit their website at accentassurance.com. All right, okay. Uh, we have a lot to talk to you about. Let's bring him in. Collaborator every Monday evening. Eric Engels of Sportsnet at sportsnet.ca. What's going on? What's going on? I'm looking uh, looking a lot taller than you uh, all of a sudden here. Uh, you are looking taller than oh, me, yeah, but it's a, it's a problem I have, which uh, I've been trying to fix for a little while. And I either need a shorter tripod or I need a platform for the seat to go on top of, or I need a chair that actually goes higher. Anyway, one day. Yeah, this isn't better. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's all good. I, this is the beauty of doing stuff like this, you know. Of working on the internet, we gotta, we gotta. You know, while you're doing this, as a matter of fact, I can tell you that, and I'll do this. You gotta get your chair higher. I don't know. Yeah, the sick podcast is also brought to you in part by Manscaped. Top of the evening to you. This episode is brought to you by St. Patrick's Day Shamrock Shavers Manscaped. This year, don't just chase rainbows. Make your own pot of gold and groom your little leprechaun, Eric Engels, with the leaders in below the kilt care. Say goodbye to your clover forest, Eric, with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra and let your confidence shine bright. Embrace the luck of the Irish and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, head over to manscaped.com and use code Montreal for 20% off and free shipping. All right, okay. So there you that's exactly we need, we, what it looks like. It's, it's official. We need to get you sitting on a phone book or something. Uh, yeah, we definitely do. Anyway, I'm going to figure it out. I have somebody coming over to my house this week who told me he's going to help me out. Uh, okay. All right, okay. Um, the Canadians, by the way, 
Uh, they made a deal earlier today, and you're probably saying, hold on a second, I thought you can't make trades. It's a minor league deal, of course. The Canadians acquired forward Arnaud Durando from the New Jersey Devils in exchange for forward Nathan Legaré. So uh, a minor league deal there. Any thoughts either way uh, from you on that? The only thought is obviously the Canadians feel it's pretty important to make the playoffs with Laval this season. And you know what? I know a lot of people look at Laval and be like, how could they not make the playoffs? Five teams and out of seven in the division will, will make it. Or five teams out of eight in their division. Uh, but they came into the season with the, the youngest team in the American Hockey League. So it, it's just yeah. they, they obviously have had some ups, some downs. They've had some goaltending issues. Uh, but now they're trying to make a charge here. And uh, they had a big weekend obviously, with uh, winning a couple games and a few of the teams in front of them losing, uh, which is very important. And we'll see where it goes, but it's clear that the Canadians want to make that happen. And and you can see why, not just obvious, obviously for the players that are there, uh, but also for the players that are coming, like David Reinbacker or Adam Engstrom or Lane Hudson or, you know, whoever, go down the list. So Mayu. we'll see what happens. Yeah, for Mayu who's yeah. there, exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, I, I know one week ago, when last time you joined this, you thought that when all was said and done, David Savard was likely going to be traded, and you thought the Canadians would retain fifty percent of the salary. If I can, and I've done this before, I'm going to do my old Barry Horowitz from the WWF and pat yeah, yeah. myself there on the go. back because I got that one. I didn't think they were going to trade David Savard. Um, I thought they would have if they would have got exactly what they wanted. I didn't think GMs were going to give them exactly what they wanted doesn't mean i agree with that by the way because to tell you the truth i think edmonton should have gone after david savard i've even said that the new york Islanders should have gone after david savard so I, you know, I there's a couple of teams i think should have acquired david savard who i think can help a team in the playoffs in a year where i think a lot of teams think that they can win the stanley cup i think florida probably thinks they can i think vegas thinks they can i think edmonton thinks they can i think winnipeg thinks they can i think vancouver thinks they can dallas probably thinks they can the Rangers probably think there's probably a lot of teams who think that they can win the Stanley Cup. And maybe some other teams think, you know what, if we get into the playoffs, who knows if they have that mentality. But anyway, long story short, <clears throat> when all was said and done, he was not traded. Logic will tell us that they didn't get what they wanted for him, and that's why he wasn't traded. Because I believe that, once again, Kent Hughes would have traded him if he would have got exactly what he absolutely wanted. Your thoughts? Yeah, I w wanted or was willing to part with if he was able to get that price. There's, there's a bit of a difference in the framing there because they didn't want to trade David Savard. They were just willing to trade him if they could uh, obtain a certain price for him. And the biggest reason they didn't is because the market shifted, um, which is surprising to me. I think a couple of things shifted the market. You know, one, the first thing that shifted the market was the trade that Craig Conroy made uh, with Chris Tanev. Um, you know, it's, it's weird. Like you hear the, the conversation around the league as we approach the deadline being like, well, they're rentals. Like how much are you going to really give up to them? Like we're not that far removed from a time where rentals went for at times a first, uh, a prospect and a player. Like let's not kid ourselves in terms of what rentals have always fetched at the deadline. First line, first round picks have gone around quite a bit. Second round picks for lesser players, but you know, David Savard wasn't a rental, but at the same time, the market shifted when Craig Conroy accepted what he accepted from Dallas. And I know in Calgary and what he is has argued to that fan base and everybody else is that the player that they got back, the prospect on defense, is is the key part of the deal for them, much more so than getting a first-round pick. But I think the Dallas Stars would have given up that player and a first-round pick to get Chris Tanev because I don't think they had anybody else on their list that was this close to uh, to where they had him ranked uh, in terms of what could help their team, uh, including a player like David Savard who was under contract for one more year. There was only a few teams that that was a real advantage for that they could have David Savard for two seasons. The, the team that I thought would be most likely to get him would be Toronto. And when we spoke last week, they had added Ilya Libushkin, but still had space available to potentially take on David Savard. But it's clear on, I think it was Thursday or Wednesday that they picked up Joel Edmondson. It became clear mm -hmm. that they weren't going to pay the price force of art and therefore that that was the time where for me it was it became a lot less likely that Savard was going to move at the deadline so and I I, yeah. I, I did say this to you and I, I'm going to stand by it right now 
now that he's here and staying, the earliest possible date I think David Savard will move from the Canadians is next deadline. And that's if and only if the Canadians are far out of the contention for a playoff spot, which I don't necessarily believe will be the case. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, but I, you know, with all due respect, I think that's pretty logical, Eric, and I'm going to tell you why. If a team didn't pick him up right before the deadline, what are the chances of them picking him up in the offseason? So he'll go. I believe the Canadians will trade him, and it'll happen. If I look back at when they traded Monaghan, which I think was about, what, five to six weeks before the deadline? So I think that the same thing will happen with Savard. He'll be traded next season. Why? Anywhere between a month Why? and deadline day. Why? Why? Yeah. Because I because I don't think he's in their long term plans, and I don't think they're going to resign him, and I don't think that they want to hold on to him for the rest of the season, and then end up losing him for nothing. Even though they might be knocking on the door and they might be battling for a playoff spot, I think when Kent Hughes has a plan, he doesn't deviate. When he acquires Sean Monahan with a first round pick, the plan was to trade Monahan for another first round pick. But his plan was to keep David Savard. Pardon me? His plan through the deadline was to keep David Savard unless somebody stepped up and really offered something that would enable him to say, okay, we can't justify keeping him versus the value that we're getting. Now that they've kept him, why would the plan be to get him out the door uh, You know, if they're knocking on the door of a playoff spot? Because they'd rather take something than nothing. Uh, I I don't think that's true. And I think based on the question I asked Kent Hughes, um, Mm -hmm. Uh, during the during the press conference, yeah, you know where he said, "Of course, asset management is vital for us, but it, it's not yeah. the be all end all in the decision making process of what to do with a certain player at a given point." Obviously, they feel David Savard adds a certain amount of value to their team. He'll yeah. The reason they feel that way is not just based on what he offers them off the ice. It's mm-hmm. also what he does on the ice. And I think both those elements could be something that they take advantage of through the term of his contract and worry about at a later point. Uh, if it comes down to it, them losing him for nothing. I don't know how high that risk is um, yeah. just based on where he'll be at in his career at that point. I think yeah. he can go year to year at that point on contracts. And if the Canadians feel they still need time with some of their other right-handed prospects, they'll take that time. He yeah. will buy those prospects time next season if he's in the fold. And like I said, they value him because he helps make them competitive. Uh, and they want to be more com- – the next season is not this season, which we'll have a lot of time to discuss. But they want to I be competitive you. next season. More so, they said coming into this season, they didn't necessarily want to be in the lottery race, but understood that it could be possible. Next season, their intention will be to be competing for a playoff spot. Whether that's realistic or not will be up for debate, and it will be a summer's worth of debate and a whole few months of the first half of the next season type of debate uh, based on whatever Kent gets done during the summer. But it's, you know... At a certain point, you got to take this thing forward, and I think we're reaching that point. I hear you. Um, only time will tell. At this point, we don't know if I'm going to be right. You're going to be right. I'm willing to put a lunch or a supper right now, even one year away, by the way, but that we could revisit next year if you want, that regardless of where they are in the standings next year, they will trade David Savard before trade deadline day. I understand what Kent told you. Kent's an amazing businessman. He's a stockbroker, and he's a poker player. Uh, I don't expect him to give you all the information, and sometimes he gives information, um, but not all of it. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't just me. It was a, during the press conference. That's what he yeah. was talking about. Yeah, I know. I know. But the bottom line is, uh, but what I'm trying to say is, won't move the press conference doesn't matter where we are next year. I'm going to trade David Savard by the deadline next year. Not going to do that either, right? I know, but I don't. Okay, I, I don't. We'll we'll see what happens when we come around to next season and where the Canadians are at and what kind of things happen to them in the lead up to the trade deadline. But yeah. the reason they value David Savard is not just because he's great at mentoring the kids. Like they they value him because they feel he can make them more competitive. And yeah, they won't have reason to I don't think you worry about, oh, let's go beef up another team's playoff opportunities and collect a draft pick if our team is sitting in a playoff position a month ahead of the deadline. Like I that doesn't make sense. No, but at the same time, he is what? The Montreal Canadiens, and there's no doubt that he's one of their better defensemen. You're not going to get an argument from me 
But at the same time, I think we have to put things in context as well. I don't think either. I don't think he'll be worth as much. Like he won't be worth as much to another team uh, when by the time we get there next season. If he wasn't worth that to them over two runs at his contract, not so sure. I agree. Not so. Not so sure. You think he's going to be healthier and faster and better next year? Like, well, the law of physics says no. Okay. But you know, then again, I don't know what kind of shape David Savard is going to be in next year. Um, He's got the type of body, with all due respect to him, like he's probably in amazing shape, but visually, probably, probably not at the top of his shape. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But the law of physics says no. You get older, you don't get in better shape. But you know, Chris Chelly has defied the law of physics. I don't know. Like, you will his value? Will his value be be the the question this time around? And it'll be the same yes. question next time around. Is will his value be better on the market than it will be to his team? That's, that's a good question. Well, that's but, what it comes you know, down to. So even if they make the playoffs next year, I mean, is the value lasting one round or getting something for him? And I think they can get a lot for him. No, uh, by a lot, I don't mean a first-round draft pick. That's not going to happen. But I think a lot of teams would like the fact that he's going to be in the last year of his contract and they won't be on the hook for a lot of money. I think the Canadians would rather get playoff experience if he helps them get there than – that'll be enough for them to say, oh, if we lose him as a free agent, then we lose him as a free agent, which I don't even think they'd have to do. I also think that he can come back next season and play in a bit of a diminished role over the one that he had this season, and that'll be good for them too because it'll mean other guys are taking on more. So I don't – I just – there's a reason they held on to him this time around. It's not as if they couldn't get something good for him at this year's deadline. Yeah. There was something good they could have gotten for him. It just wasn't what they were willing to take to take him off their team. That's the value right. proposition at all times, Tony. Yeah. No matter who the player is we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Are they worth more to us or are they worth more on the market? And they deemed he was worth more to them. And that's because he still had a year under his contract. So I think they'll use him. And if they're what, what you mean all out of it. Deemed- Hold on a second. You're saying the Canadians deemed he was worth more to them than other teams? No, he was the worth, Canadians set a price for him. They didn't get it. So he was worth him. more. He was worth more to them than what he proved to be on the market. Otherwise, he oh, would have been okay, traded. Yes, yes. And if they would have got a first round pick for them, they would have deemed the exact opposite, and they would have traded him. Yes, probably. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think Jim that Allen. equation's the same. Like it's not the same equation next year because they're not hoping to be in the same circumstances next year. And if they find themselves in the circumstances they would hope to be in, which is in a playoff spot a month from the deadline, they're not going to move David Savard just because somebody says, "Oh, you know what? We'd take him for a second round pick." Like I, I don't well, see that happening. We'll revisit next year. Let's talk about Jake Allen because I know we know that he was traded. And the Canadians got a third round pick in 2025. And based on the conditions that are, I think it's probably safe to say that it will end up being a third round pick in 2025. They pay 50% of his salary. Um, What did you make of um, the three goalie system finally coming to an end? Well, the trade itself, I was, I was, I was pretty surprised that they got it done. Didn't think it would happen. Thought it was going to be punted to the offseason. Didn't think that they would have an issue trading him in the offseason. But it was surprised to see it happen at the deadline for a couple of reasons. One, no no other goaltenders were basically moved except for a uh, a middling guy who, who moved earlier in the day or whatever it was. But up until that point, the goaltending market was dead. Teams that needed goalie or goalies earlier in the season decided to roll the dice on who they had. So those opportunities closed up. And New Jersey, you know, you felt if they were going to make a move, it would have been for Jacob Markstrom out of Calgary. Uh, so, and and Jake Allen had to waive his no trade clause to go to New Jersey. It's not a team that he necessarily wanted to go to for one reason or another. Uh, it was on his list. So I was really surprised when that deal came through less than 30 minutes from the deadline. And um, I think mean, it was pretty tidy work considering what you've been saying for a long time that this was statistically his his worst season and just the market being what it was to even get a third round pick uh even for retaining his salary it's i think it's a good deal uh for the canadians i think it'll end up being a better deal for the canadians than it will be for the devils who 
uh, with respect to Jake Allen, who I think will help stabilize their situation there, they they need more than just that in that. So I I, I was I was surprised. Yeah, I'm not surprised that he was traded, even though he was having the worst season statistically of his career. Teams like to get insurance policies. They do it at all positions. Goalie is no different. You have a team that's paying 50% of your salary. I'm just surprised that he went to New Jersey. I don't get it. It doesn't look like New Jersey is going to make the playoffs. It doesn't mean they can't. There's six points behind a wild card spot. Uh, mind you, they've played a game more than the Islanders today. But I, I, I don't know. I just I don't. I don't. Well, they're going to New Jersey. Yeah, I, I, listen. I don't. I don't get a lot of the things they did in the lead up to this. Uh, you know, it seems Tom Fitzgerald acted pretty late on a number of fronts. Whether it was acquiring a, a top level goaltender like Jacob Markstrom or deciding to fire his coach at a point where they seem to fall too far out of the race to catch up. I think if you're going to justify the logic of it, they don't want to go through another season where they're out there searching for for reliable options in their net. I, I think they're still going to go out and get a number one type guy in the summer. But now with Kakinen in, with Allen in, uh, and under contract, they have a chance to create a race uh, and and have um, a certain level of depth and assurance at that position that they feel was a big factor in why they were disappointing this season. So I, again, it's their problem. Like, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, Kent Hughes doesn't have to care about it. Uh, he ends up with a third round pick that could become a second. I agree with you. It's most likely going to be a third, although yeah. who knows, man, like maybe whoever they bring in gets hurt. And Allen ends up playing his 40 games and ends up saving their season. It's not like he's incapable of doing it with a good team in front of him. So we'll see. Let's uh, talk about Caden Primo now because the three goalie system has come to an end. So it's Montembeau and Caden Primo uh, for at least the rest of the season. Then we'll see going forward. Marty St. Louis earlier today on Caden Primo's progression. Let's bring it up. How's the Caden has played this season on the whole? How has he improved? How, how do you... Caden came for you. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. How uh, how do you feel he's improved? How do you how do you rate his performance? Well, he's taking a jump, you know, and, and you know, the, you think about the three goalie rotation, and it's not an easy thing for the goalies. But I think I think for Jake it was probably harder to to gain anything out of that than for because of, you know where he is in his career. But I think you look at a goalie like Primes, who's young, and, you know, how are you going to grow? Is it more games or more practice time? You know, so I feel like Primes has had a lot of practice time. So is, is, is that part? Is the three goalie situation, is that part of his growth because he had more practice time? We'll never know, but we're happy where he is right now with the situation we were in this year. He's taking a jump, and... Is it more practices? Is it more time with his goalie coach? I don't know, but uh, we're happy where he is. He feels Ooh. he feels that it was good for him. The fact that he had the mental approach to ensure that it would be. What do you think that says? Well, I mean, I think it's a sign of maturation. You know, I think the the generation today, the young guys, they want it. They want everything, and they want it now. And 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 it's just a generation, you know. And they want. They usually want things with bare minimum. You know, it, uh, it, you know, and it's a challenge. And we, you know, he's had to, you know, he's had a lot of practice time, but he also has had to earn some of his starts with a three goalie rotation. And I think he's handled it really well. And like I said, same thing with Army. Like everything starts with the player. You know, we can, we can try to help him as much as we can, but it starts with the player. And Prime's done it, has done his part for sure. Uh, very diplomatic of Marty St. Louis. God love him for saying, uh, for the most part, that he thinks this young generation is spoiled. Uh, <laughs> and, and who knows, maybe even entitled. No, but he didn't say that. It's my interpretation. Doesn't mean he, that that's what it is, okay? But uh, I understood what he was saying about Caden Primo. You wrote an article on him earlier today. Tell me. Mental performance coach? Yeah, so look... I agree with Marty completely. Um, there is, and 
you don't want to generalize, but in general, um, you know, you look at a generation that has had uh, that has access to everything, right? Anything you want nowadays, and us us too, we benefit from that. Anything you want is at the tip of your finger and your phone, right? Like you you can order anything you need, you can get it almost instantly delivered. You can have anything you you want in life, and I think that has created a certain and and bring it to professional sports and bring it to an NHL that has had to get younger due to the salary cap. And you combine those two factors. And there are a lot of players who, when they don't get what they want and don't get it immediately, uh, they can be quite impatient about the whole thing and not be able to put things in perspective. I think Caden Primo, when you look at the circumstances that he was faced with this year, it could have been extremely negative. It could have been what everybody thought it was going to be and what it was um, in terms of a detriment to his development. He didn't see it that way at all, and he never approached it that way, and that's the reason why it wasn't. It could have been that, but Caden Primo had the maturity to go out and say, I'm going to work. I'm going to take advantage of every minute I have personal and, and private with uh, Eric Raymond, the goaltending coach, on and off the ice. Uh, I'm going to work, which he invested in over a year ago uh, in terms of hiring a mental performance coach. Uh, not the one that the Canadians currently employ, but somebody else that coming out of that 21-22 season when the Canadians brought Caden Primo up at a time where they were injury plagued and playing awful hockey and didn't have any other options and kind of threw them to the wolves because they didn't have a choice. Uh, it really did some damage. It, it did some damage for him mentally. And I asked him today, like, were you able to put that time in perspective? Like that, you know, like it wasn't your fault what was happening? And he said, well, at the time, no, like I, the competitor in me put it all on myself, right? Like you're a goaltender, you're the last line of defense. You want to be the savior in that situation. And here's Primo, young Primo, inexperienced and thrown to the wolves and, you know, trial by fire and just no help in front of him. Just a, a, an unwinnable situation, if you remember, Tony. And um, I think it just smacks of maturity that he never hesitated for a second that when he realized that his confidence has had dropped and affected his play to the point that it was worth evaluating something beyond just the physical technical elements of playing goalie that he goes out and consults with a mental performance coach and a big big thing that people need to know is that there's a major difference between a sports psychologist and a mental performance coach. A mental performance coach focuses on performance. They they give you tools related specific to confidence, but also, as Primo said, gaining perspective, putting things in proper perspective. And he put his situation this season in proper perspective and handled it like a true pro. And the opportunity that he has in front of him now it, it, how he took advantage of it helped put him in this opportunity and he fully earned what he's got coming to him now and I think his approach is probably the biggest reason why you might be able to put faith in him succeeding in this role right like the pressure is yeah. finally on him to be a backup goalie in the NHL and push Sam Montembeau to potentially down the line be the starter whether or not you believe he technically has that ability we're going to find out because he's going to have time to play. But mentally, the strength that he's exhibited in coming back from where he fell down to and how he handled this year's situation is a pretty good reason to believe that he might take advantage of this. I know um, a couple of years ago, I had a conversation which, um, you know, it was, I was not told that I could use it on the record. So I'll, treated as off the record for now from someone who has a lot of experience in hockey who now makes their living um, talking hockey um, like us um, who has known and watched Caden Primo going back six or seven years. And according to this person, uh, Primo's weakness or what he had to work on was the mental aspect of the game. This is what I was told a couple of years ago in terms of, um, the ability to shake off the bad goal and not let it result in a second bad goal, like right away or another goal right away or another goal, not let it affect the rest of his game where it's, it's like, okay, you know what? It's not my night. And like not fight as much as he 
would with the intention of like going into the game. And it's something that I think you could probably say was still true. I mean, at one point that game where he gave up five to the same corner or he, 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 we saw instances earlier in the season where a bad goal followed a bad goal, but I've seen some improvements and, and some, and some, uh, steps forward taken here over the last little while. And I think Marty was talking about that as well. The maturation, I would imagine the mental performance coach has, uh, has a lot to do with this. Um, I could, I could tell you that, um, that, um, you know, my boy who's playing in Portugal right now, I set up zoom calls with a mental performance coach when I find that uh, he needs it or he thinks he needs it or he asks for it. And um, it helps. It was, it was so interesting speaking with Caden about it. And, you know, as the reporter in that situation, I'm not looking for Caden to div divulge whatever secrets uh, he has in terms of those interactions, right? Like there is a certain level of privacy you respect. You know, I don't expect them to sit here and, and get into the sessions word for word of what he was going through. But I, I asked him if he was hesitant to go and talk to somebody about this stuff. And he said, no, he said, but you know, he, there's a feeling out process through the first couple of sessions, but when you see an immediate result from those conversations, it allows you to dive right into the deep end with it. And that's exactly what he's done. He, he, without giving away the details of what they've worked on together, and he's had some, co a couple conversations with JF Minard, he hasn't worked with him personally, that's yeah. who the Canadians employs a, a mental performance yes. coach. But he sees yeah. absolutely the benefit and thinks he's brilliant. Um, but this was, you know, this was this predated that and going back over a year. And he, he just said, he just said that he's benefited so much from it that yeah. that from a, from a building up his confidence and and having certain foundations to rely on to get back to it when it gets shaken by this or that. Um, and like you're right, Tony had that one game where he he allowed the, the goals to cascade, right? Like where one bad one yeah. hits him with a glove and then he gets hit four times. Yeah. Yeah. Like see the way he came back from that though? Like it, it's a totally different thing that we saw from what we saw in the past, right? And I I just this kid cares so much about this opportunity. He's worked his whole life for it. Uh he's a real pro. He's not a go out and party kid. He's a he's a good kid. And uh, he he took it upon himself to develop in every way he possibly could to earn this this opportunity he's gotten. And I think his yeah. play throughout the season was the biggest argument against the idea that the three goalie rotation was hurting him this year. Like he had performed steadily and successfully, with the exception of that game that we're talking about. Yeah, um, and I just I. I think he'll take uh, uh, another step in that direction now that he has this hobby. It might not happen immediately. I think people should be, you know, understanding if Tuesday night against the Columbus Blue Jackets, it's nobody's best game. Like the Canadians were on a long road trip. Marty was saying he was thankful that it was Toronto and Saturday night for them to play that first game back. Uh, if there's a letdown coming, it probably comes against the Columbus team. You don't expect them to have trouble with. And we'll see how Primo handles that situation in the first real, the first official game he's playing as the backup goalie of the Montreal Canadiens, like really in an official capacity. And there's a bit more pressure on the line. And so we'll see how he deals with it. But I'd more look at it and say, see how he deals with this situation from here to the end of the season and not just one game. He's earned that benefit of the doubt. And I, I think he could take another step. But super interesting for me, hearing how as a 24 year old he took it upon himself to hey i'm gonna hire a mental performance coach i'm gonna work on this other element yeah. and i marty's right it is it is a sign of maturity and a maturity that yeah. is not necessarily found in a lot of other people his age it's an interesting conversation because throughout the entire season when we've talked about the three goalie system and although no one was really crazy about it i maintained um you know, whether it was, uh, you know, my own personal opinion or, or um, you know, in debates uh, on radio, television, podcasts with other members of the media, I maintained that it didn't hurt Primo. 
And uh, I know a lot of people believe that it did. And I don't, and this is my logic to it all, okay? So Caden Primo could have played more games at the American Hockey League level. That's true. Then he would have been playing at the National Hockey League level. That's true. So let's just say the Canadians, Primo played 13 with the Canadians. Let's just say Primo would have been part of a two-goalie system and they would have moved Allen at the beginning of the year. So Primo would have played after 64 games. Let's say Montembeau would have played 44 and Primo would have played 20 or 43 and 21. So Primo probably could have played eight more games in the National Hockey League. He's played 14. If, He's made 14. Played 14. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say he could have played 22 or 23. So he could have played eight or nine more games. But if he wasn't here and he was in Laval, he would have lost out on practices with NHL players for middle of September. So to middle of October, to middle of November, or end of September, to end of October, to end of November, to end of December, to end of January, to end of February, to the month of March now. So how many practices over four or five months at the NHL level compared to eight or nine less games? Don't you think he's better off here and having all those more practices versus NHL players with the only drawback being eight or nine less? Like, I don't get it. So Even I personally, I think it was better for him. Let's put it this way. Even if I didn't agree with you, even if most of the fans didn't agree with you, even if the organization themselves didn't necessarily agree or the coach, and I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm just making a point here. Even if nobody agreed, Primo didn't see any of it as a negative. Primo didn't think it was bad for him at all. Primo believed that he would benefit from spending the year in the NHL, no matter how many games he played versus playing 55 in the AHL this year. So, so long as Primo felt the benefit of it. Yeah. Didn't view it as a negative. That's all that really matters in this, in this equation, right? Like, cause it's up to him to be the best version of himself. And look, I don't think he would sit there and say that this was the optimal thing for him. Maybe he'd be even a step ahead if he played a bit more and got a bit more practice time in the actual practices themselves instead of having to rotate in and out of the net with whoever the backup was going to be for, for that night or whether he was the backup and the third guy. But he made the best of this situation. So did the uh -huh. Canadians. He was lucky to have a guy like Jake Allen, who it was the worst for, be such a pro. And i got to say, for, for on Jake's side, which... I'm not sure how much the fans even realize this. If you go back two training camps ago when there was a race between Jake and Primo and Montembeau, and uh, you know Primo was obviously in a situation where he wasn't going to be able to win that race unless he played like uh, the second coming of Patrick Waugh in training camp and whatever mm -hmm. limited action he was going to see. Jake was talking about Caden as the future of the Montreal Canadiens goaltending position. It was it was Jake who was you know asked about Sam and and Caden and really talking up Caden as the next guy and that I I know that meant a lot to Primo. And I know he not only told us that and and everybody who would listen, he told Primo that too and supported him and that's a big part of how this player's confidence has been able to rebound from the position he was in in 21-22 where he was, you know, here he was up the creek without a paddle with the Canadians and it, it affected him. So I just think all 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 with it all done and behind us now. Uh -huh. Um this kid still found a way to get better. There's no like denying that he's gotten better this year. There there's no denying it. Whether or not he could have gotten even better if he had played more, that's debatable. Yeah. But I think what's most important is how he feels about it and he feels good about it. So that's, I think that's positive. You know, before we get uh, to another player who probably has been going through the same thing and probably benefited from the same thing. Uh, there's a bunch of people watching, of course, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 
and I think we have to get to last game. And they're probably wondering what in the world happened between Arbor, Jack Guy, and Ryan Reese. I mean, George Lorac was on on Friday night. Uh, and uh, he said Arbor Jack guy and Ryan Rees will fight, and Arbor Jack guy will win, and Ryan Rees will end up in the minors and never play another game in the National Hockey League again. Uh, George gets pretty excited from time to time and tends to exaggerate a little bit. Um, uh, I know, having spoken to him earlier today on BPM Sports Radio, that um, he thought it wasn't up to Jack guy to make the first move. He thought it was up to Rees to make the first move because Rees did not look good. Uh, when they fought each other on opening night in mid-October in Toronto, uh, he thought that Jack Guy played a pretty physical game and didn't shy away. And he thought that Reese had ample opportunity to go after Jack Guy, but did not. Did you see it the same way? Were you surprised that the two didn't go on Saturday night? Uh, and if you were surprised, why do you think it is they didn't? Uh, I wasn't surprised. I think game circumstances had something to do with it, right? Like the Canadians fell, uh, they, they went up one nothing early. Um, so maybe Jack guy doesn't have the green light to fight at that point of the game where the Canadians are leading and doesn't want to give Toronto a kind of an emotional boost, especially with how flat they looked in the first period. That could be part of it. The other part of it is when they find themselves on the ice together against each other, end of shift, beginning of shift. Um, one way or the other, it, it didn't happen. I did see one really strong hit from Jaden Strubel on Ryan Reeves. <laughs> I thought he mm -hmm. might, thought he might. Uh, take out some aggression somewhere else on the ice after that. But I don't know. You know, George is more of an expert on that than I am. And I, I'm willing to concede that any minute of any day. Uh, I just, I don't, it was a close game all the way through. You know, maybe yeah. if, maybe if uh, the score changes significantly one way or the other, this, this happens. There's still one more game though, between these two teams. So. There is on a Saturday night. What is the first week of April? I think in Toronto. Yeah, April sixth, I believe, but here in Montreal. Yeah, I think so. It's in Montreal. Yeah. Oh, it's in Montreal. Really? Yeah, I thought it was in Toronto that game. All right. No, okay. no more games uh, in Toronto. Oh yeah. Okay. Only um, one this year. Really do. weird. But anyways. Yeah, the one had to be the opening night of the season. You're right. Yeah. 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 There it is. It is in Montreal. You're right. Okay. Okay. Look at that. Uh. <sighs> The rest of the schedule, by the way, is like really heavy duty. Okay. So they probably look, uh, they're not taking on a giant killer tomorrow night when they host Columbus. But on Thursday, they host Boston. On Saturday, they visit Calgary. On Tuesday, they visit Edmonton. On Thursday, they visit Vancouver. On Sunday, they're in Seattle. On Tuesday, they're in Colorado. And then after that, they host Philadelphia and Carolina. That's the rest of their month of look. They have, a, they have a you know what Tony, uh, the rest of March. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. They have they, they have a game against Columbus here. They have a game towards the end of the season against Ottawa. They have eight games against teams that are in the top ten, and they have another four games against teams that are right on the bubble of the playoffs. Uh, like the four four like that are in the playoffs, and then another couple against teams that are right on the bubble. Uh, so they have, according to some people, the second hardest schedule from here to the end of the season. Yeah. Um, if you're a tank enthusiast, you might be looking at that and saying, well, that's good news. Uh, but good news. I would, but I would also suggest that it keeps the Canadians engaged from here to the end because they're not going to want to get embarrassed. And they haven't been embarrassed in any of these games. Like, it's pretty unbelievable. You go even back to the five-game losing streak and where it went to from there. Like, their their worst game that they played in the last month is against Arizona, a game that they won. And mm -hmm. you look at the games against Florida, Tampa, Nashville, Carolina, and Toronto. And I'd argue they were the better team in four of those five. And the Carolina game was a lot closer than the score ended up being at four one. Sorry for the beeping, my dishwasher. That's I gotta, okay. Got to stop running that That's thing when we're doing the podcast. That's okay. Well, technically, you know, you say the last month it's March eleventh. On February eleventh, they lost seven two at home versus uh, St. Louis. That was that was one of the worst ones. I've seen yeah. this season, if not the worst. Yeah. But then yeah. since then, settled down pretty good. They lost uh lost the game a couple of days later. They gave up seven in New York versus the Rangers. But in the last, I would say uh three 
So right after that game, four weeks. Yeah, they've been they've been they've been pretty good. They've been pretty good. They'll they'll remain in game. They'll remain. Speaking of the schedule, Marty St. Louis earlier today on the tough schedule left. Let's bring it up. Uh, tu regardes notre cédule, on, je pense qu'on a cédule la plus tough dans la ligue, euh, euh, dans le stretch. Euh, fait que euh, c'est, c'est, des, c'est des gros défis. On est là, des fois ça prend un petit peu plus de finition, ça prend... Uh... All right, there you have it. Marty St. Louis says, uh, you know, they take a look at the schedule down the stretch. We probably have one of the toughest schedules, but it's a bigger challenge. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to deal with it. There you have it. Yeah. I, I just think he probably feels good about the fact that the, the Canadians have been so engaged in these games. I think it's, I think it's win-win for everybody here, right? For the tank enthusiasts like yourself who want to see them lose as many games as possible and improve their draft positioning, it's, it's likely assured with the competition they face. But for them and wanting to continue to grow their culture and the way they play and their ability to take a step forward next year it's remaining close with those teams within those games and that's what they've done recently and that's what they hope to continue to do moving forward and obviously they'd like to win as many of them as they possibly can but they're not under any illusions about what they have as a lot yeah. versus some of those teams and what's at stake yeah. for those teams versus what's at stake for theirs over the next few weeks marty st louis with a great quote today and he said The NHL um, used to be an older league years ago. And it was more difficult for young players to grab their spot because it wasn't a development league. But now you have to have the mentality of development because the players are younger. So Marty St. Louis talking about how the league has changed over the years. An older league before, so less development or no development. And younger league now with younger players, so you're going to have to have more development. It's a, it's an interesting um, analogy. Uh, Armia, I want to talk to you about him because you talked about players who Marty St. Louis says Primo's made a jump. Armia's made a jump in the last, I would say, this last four weeks that we've been talking about seems to be a better player and playing better with more consistency than he has in at least a couple of years now. Is that the same key to success as Caden Primo uh, and mental performance coach? Yeah, I think, listen, first of all, I think it's been over three months with Armia. I, I think he's been extremely consistent in terms of what he's offered. And, you know, Marty was asked if it's almost as if he's been coaching a different player like he's gotten a different value player out of out of that whole process. Yes, it, it does have to do with Armia having a very difficult time getting over mistakes that he made in games and letting them weigh him down from shift to shift. And that's why you see his game go up and down so much. And now, admittedly himself, with the work he's done with Jeff Menard, who is employed by the Canadians as a mental performance coach, has found better resources to park those mistakes immediately and move on to the next play and continue to have a positive impact within a game and continue to reach further into the depth of his own talent and ability to perform more consistently. The one thing that I want to bring up, whether it's about Primo or Armia, Uh Or a guy like Josh Anderson who's chosen not to consult with these types of people is... Oh, really? He hasn't? Okay. Yeah, he he hasn't. Like Arpen Basu wrote a story about this in The Athletic, speaking to Anderson about how he can still rebound and be a better player next year. And he's going to have to do that, obviously. Um, He asked him if you... you you know, I had had asked Anderson about this a while back. I didn't write about it because I, I didn't want to slant it one way or another in terms of the decision and i'll tell you exactly why um because he arpin had asked anderson if he had used jeff menard at all yet he's like no he didn't strike the possibility of potentially going down that road in the future but hadn't felt it was necessary and when i spoke to him going back a couple months if he had ever considered it i kind of framed it as like this isn't a sports psychologist right like it's a performance coach so yeah. maybe like it doesn't necessarily have to be 
because you feel your game is slipping or is in a negative place that you have to go and have that. I, I think there's that's the point I kind of want to make here is your game doesn't have to be in a bad place for you to benefit from that resource. Yeah. Like, I've had a couple of brief conversations with JF Menard and he, like anybody else in the organization who is tasked with coaching players on an individual basis, is not going to divulge what he talks about with this person or that person. Of but course not. One of the things he told me that I thought was super interesting that I think could apply to any player who's even playing really well is yeah. he talked about, you know, like rest and recovery is such an underrated yeah part of performance like he was saying that if you look at the yeah. very best athletes in the world guys and the guys who have had the longest careers um he pointed to lebron james as an example they uh, sleep more than anybody else cristiano okay. ronaldo is another one there you go so and so yeah. it was just a small example of like this guy has worked with olympians across several different sports he's gotten to pick the brains of so many elite athletes whether you're Josh Anderson or you're Joel Armia or you're Caden Primo and players that have had certain issues that they would certainly benefit from that work and two of the three already have. Yeah. You could be Nick Suzuki too and benefit from the work with those types of guys. And I just, you know, I remember a couple of seasons ago when Jonathan Drouin was really going through a difficult time. I had asked him like, you know, um, Nathan McKinnon, your, your, your good buddy in Colorado talked about how, yeah for his first three seasons, he wasn't able to access the best version of himself and did some work with a sports psychologist that he felt was majorly beneficial. And yeah. I said, well, I never felt like it got that bad that I needed that. And it's like Drew at the time was, you know, 24 years old or whatever, like still young. Like it's just, I just hope that the athletes out there, not only take yeah. advantage of the resources that are available to the, to them, but also are able to reframe it in their own minds that you don't have to be struggling to benefit from this type of work. You talked about doing it with your son and having him yeah. talk to somebody when he feels he needs it, but it would be great if your son also looked at the situation and said, this is a tool that I could use to get even better while I'm thriving. Like, Correct. The right. more and more athletes need It not to only helps you when you have a dip in performance, it helps yeah. you when you want to increase performance. You need to be able to view it in a different and, – and I understand why an athlete, a pro athlete who has worked his entire life to get to where he gets to and knows the path would yeah. ha view that type of work with a certain stigma attached to it or a certain, oh, there must be something wrong for me to do that. Yeah, it's understandable I, that that would be a natural inclination, right? They just yeah. you hope that the people in the organization frame it properly because it, JF Menard is not going to go force himself on any players. It's not up to no. Marty St. Louis to turn to Josh Anderson and say, go speak to this guy. Like, of course not. It's they, they, come can, from the that, they can make suggestions. But like in any case, whether you're dealing with a mental performance coach, a goaltender coach, a skills coach, Dr. Shot, who comes in and helps players with their shot, you're in a way yeah. better place if it's your players who are taking the initiative and doing it. And that brings us back to yeah. Primo, right? Like this maturity that he has showed to take ownership yeah. of his own development in one way or another, mentally, off the ice, on the ice, is a big factor in mitigating what could have been a very negative situation for him this year. Yeah, I find it unfortunate that Anderson has not wanted uh, to talk to a um, mental performance coach as of yet because, I mean, he had 21 goals in 69 games last year. He's got eight goals in 60 games this year. His performance has dipped. So maybe that, maybe I mean, that, just, uh, that's it. Maybe he just didn't see it in the light that it can be seen in. And it, it's understandable. I, I get it. I, you think about yeah. pro athletes, right? You think about everything they've done to get to where they are. Yeah. And what, and what they have to accrue as skill and development to get there. It's hard to look at yourself and say, well, that could help me when you have a negative kind of yeah. stigma attached to it, like that you, it, it, there's a real balance because you're telling yourself when you're going through struggles, I'm better than this and I know I can get back and I know I just got to remind myself that I'm good and this and that. There's a balance and it, pulling you in one direction with that stuff and having to admit to yourself, I, I don't have the answer here. Yeah. There's a confidence is a really yeah. complicated thing, man. Like, especially yeah. at this level. So I don't I don't judge Josh Anderson for that. Yeah. 
But I hope if he feels that it would be beneficial to him that he doesn't hesitate and, and goes in with an open mind and says, you know what? I'm not going to see a psychologist here. I'm not going to go divulge my secrets. I'm going to go to somebody who's an expert in their field that could potentially unlock something that helps me. And whether they do or they don't, at least you have an open mind to the possibility that it could happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. You're talking about rest and recovery. Uh, and um, Cristiano Ronaldo and LeBron James are both 39 years of age. Uh, they've been both perfecting their craft for the last 20 years. They're both going to go down as some of the greatest players to ever play their respective sports. Uh, you'd have to think that uh, even though it could be a huge debate, you'd have to think that they're going to end up being like, top three on anyone's list. And um, they both sleep about 10 hours a night. They both take like five or six naps per day of anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes. And you break it all down with practice or, you know, games. Like there's not there's not a lot of time left to go to the restaurant and do, or do things or go out with your friends. They don't. They, um, you know, and the, not to mention... Uh, they're in ice baths. They're 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 getting massages. Um, that it's it's their whole career has been about taking care of their bodies, the proper rest and relaxation. And you know what? I'm going to give my buddy. Um, I'm going to give my buddy um, Jack uh, Jack a plug here from uh, My Essentia and their mattresses. Uh, Jack is a uh, is a former Montrealer who uh, moved out to Florida, probably give or take about uh, ten years ago, and um, he was in the uh, Jack Delaccio and he was in the um, uh, the mattress business, and uh, he opened up. He had a company, My Essentia, and which uh, he actually ended up uh, going to Florida, Boca Raton, opening up the head office over there. He's got a showroom here in Montreal. He's got showrooms all over North America, as a matter of fact. They anyway, bought all those beds his, for the Habs. Yeah, a while, a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his ago. idea his idea actually uh, is to custom make a lot of mattresses for a lot of these uh, elite athletes. Uh, and you know what? They take basically their body shape and stuff like that. They ask them a couple of questions of how they sleep and how they like to sleep and what size. And you can actually custom make the mattress for them. And if they're in a couple, you can make one side of the mattress custom made for that athlete and another side of the mattress custom make it for uh their wives or their their other halves anyway it's it's um it's it's a bit once again it's rest and recovery is a huge part of thriving for athletes and you know maybe let's even expand it athletes i mean anybody really, for everybody uh, for everybody like i was listening yeah, to uh, yeah. i was listening to conan o'brien's podcast and he had adam sandler on and Conan yeah. O'Brien, for those who don't know, before he was a talk show host and before he wrote for The Simpsons for many years, he got his start as a writer on Saturday Night Live. And he was talking, this is a very recent episode, about how he used to come home from SNL bragging about how they'd stay up for two, three days in a row working on the show and so proud of how hard they were working. Uh, but in retrospect, looking back on it, probably felt he would have produced much better work if he was getting his sleep. I think all yeah. of us would feel that way about what we do yeah. in general and hockey and hockey reporting in general. Like, I don't get as much sleep as I would like, and I hope it doesn't affect my performance. But I, I have to think it would be a little bit better if I, if I got the amount of hours that I need. And a lot of the time during the week, I'll take advantage of that little window between like four and six o'clock before I have to get to the bell center where if I can get yeah. a nap in, I'm going to squeeze one in. Cause you get home from writing uh, after a game at, you know, midnight and have a hard time turning your brain from a hundred percent down to winding zero. Down. Going to yeah, sleep. Winding down. You know, you get up, you get to bed at two o'clock in the morning. I try to get a workout in before I get to practice for 10 30 in the morning. So it means I'm up seven 30, eight o'clock in the gym, back home, shower, go to the, at the end of the day, I'm not complaining. I work a lot. I get a lot of rest in the summer. That's good. But we should all value yeah. that element. And I just think it was it was interesting just speaking to Jeff Menard. It was one of the first things that he brought up when I met him. You know, I said, you know, like, what's the big difference between a sports psychologist and a performance coach? He said, well, you know, like, let me give you this example of, like, focusing on rest and recovery. Like, something that your typical 23, 24, 25-year-old athlete who's a pro – won't put as much emphasis on because they feel they have boundless energy. 
but look at the athletes who have had the lengthiest careers and uh, have been elite throughout the entirety of them, like a guy like LeBron or a guy like Cristiano Ronaldo, and they value sleep more than anybody you'll ever – They they like you turn to a 24-year-old and say, Are you, do you sleep 12 hours a night? They'd say no. Like why would I even need to do that? Well, there's That's, your answer. Yeah. Listen, it didn't, it, it, it didn't affect it negatively affect your performance tonight. I can tell you that much. But why don't we do this? Let's say goodbye so we can go both go to bed separately, of course. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> All right, Eric. Uh, I don't know why I had to. Uh, <laughs> I had to make that clear, but of course, you're your place. Yeah, let's let's do that. Hey, Eric, thanks a lot once again. Great stuff as always. We'll talk to you soon, my man. Yeah, I'll send you a booster uh, for your chair. All right, please do, please. I can use one of those uh, boosters, some baby boosters, now to a podcast booster. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Eric. We'll talk to you soon. Once again, yeah. special thanks to Energy Transportation Group. Special thanks to La Bitta TV. Special thanks to Playground, and special thanks to. Um, uh, accent uh, insurance solutions uh, for their partnership and supporting the show. We very much appreciate it. We appreciate all of you for watching as well. Don't forget, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, at the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero. It's absolutely free. Thank you. Tell your friends about it. Like it. Share it with your friends. Comment Sick S I C K S I C K. Leave us a five star review on Apple. It's our way of feeling the love. For Agnello, Sammy, and Juliana at Master Control, bidding you a very good night. They're Cavallaro. I'm Marinero. We'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place, right after the Canadians and the Columbus Blue Jackets, starting at 10 p.m. Eastern. My guest tomorrow night, former Montreal Canadian, Maxim Lapierre. Talk to you tomorrow. À demain, mes amis. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.